Rescue efforts are underway in Tennessee to find those still missing after tremendous rainfall devastated the area. They got more than 17 inches of rain there in just 24 hours. This is a new study shows that the record rainfall across Germany and Belgium last month. You may remember those pictures. That was made up to nine times more likely by the climate crisis. Meanwhile, other end of the spectrum, more than 90 massive uncontained wildfires are blazing in the West. And Vice President Kamala Harris is visiting Singapore and Vietnam this week to discuss multiple topics, including climate change. So I'd like to bring in ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z for more on this. Ginger, it's great to see you. I know this is a passion of yours. I always listen to your reports and, and the, the features you've done on this because you cover it so well, and we're really glad to have you with us. First, let me ask about what the U.S. government's doing. Uh, you know, President Biden made climate change a core part of his presidential campaign, one of his top priorities. Do you see a shift in policy, a shift in approach with this administration? Well, thank you, Terry, so much for having me. As you know, I am very passionate about this, so I've been following the administration's actions on it. And yes, I would say a 180 as far as the, the intent of where the Biden administration would like to go. Now, the action, there may be a few things that we can work on. So I'll start with Paris. He said he'd do it. Day one, he did it. Went back into the Paris Accord. Uh, people will say, well, that doesn't really mean anything, except it does in a leadership role as a leader in the world. Remember, the United States, albeit one of now the top three uh, carbon emitters, in the legacy load of what we have done to this planet with our carbon emissions, we're still number one. So we have a responsibility, and I think the Biden administration knows that. They have made a push saying that all electric vehicles for the government fleet, that's 645,000 uh, vehicles, and putting in the infrastructure. Again, it would be great to see this all come to fruition. We don't see that until it happens. And then he's reinstated some pollution uh, regulations that were taken away for pollution from cars. That was great. And then there are a couple of things that climate activists and, of course, people who uh, are disappointed that they have not done everything. And in that big infrastructure bill, the giant one, they've already backed off on some of the climate priorities trading out for Congress to pass other things. So we'll see how that all works out later this year. And finally, I think that seeing the Keystone debacle come to an end was huge. But we have to remember, there's still the Line 3 pipeline, Minnesota, where the tribal communities and a lot of the activists there are saying, hey, nobody's listening to us. We've got a big pipeline issue right here that's impacting us. And no, so far, they're very frustrated because the Biden administration has not taken action there. Well, Ginger, there are unfortunately so many areas to get to when it comes to climate change. This is why we have you. <laughs> One of the most <laughs> staggering international examples you have explained to us, the Maldives, which could become uninhabitable by 2050. Tell us about that and what's going on there. So a lot of times we cannot fathom what climate change looks like. In those pictures right there, you say, well, that looks pretty nice. But the Maldives stand to lose the most. 80% of that island nation sits only three feet above sea level or below that. So they are so at risk of sea level rise, the lowest terrain of any other country in the world. So some of the research does say they'll be uninhabitable by 2050, except one island, and that's the island of Hulhumale. That is an island that they built because of climate change. They know they're in trouble. That island is built on a coral base. They put sand on top of it so that they can get six and a half feet above sea level. Right now, 50,000 folks live in the Maldives, live on that island. They anticipate to quadruple that as they see parts of the other island go under. It's just an amazing uh, attempt to defy the processes to, to keep their homes. Uh, and another country uh, that, that we've heard about a little bit, not much, tell us more, Madagascar. More than a million people facing starvation there. Uh, the worst famine in 40 years, quietly right now. There's not been a lot of attention to it. What, what do you think? Is there a way of saying what caused that famine and how dire it is? So I can say that this is a story that has, has be, had me uh, heartbroken. When the first words came out, there are children there that are surviving by eating mud and cactus leaves only. 14,000 uh, right on the brink of famine. They anticipate that to double 
by this fall. It is all because they are in a prolonged drought, the worst drought they've seen since 1981. The population has increased greatly. They are in huge trouble because they have, they are known to be a dry nation. This is not somewhere where you get a ton of rain. But in 2020, they had not very little rain. They had none. We're talking none. So they cannot even plant. They cannot even get fresh seeds to plant for the next year. And so this is really one of those stories where, and, and I've read that this is the truest form of climate refugees. We've had other examples, smaller communities. This is a giant amount of people, 1.14 million people facing starvation. It's hard to imagine, but it's happening right now. And that is the face of climate change. Oh, we all need to pay attention to that. And it's actually something, Jen, Ginger, I was just saying, my kids need to read about that and pay attention to that and realize yeah. uh, how lucky you know we are when we have yeah. talk about stories like this. Uh, speaking of that and being grateful and, and needing to give back during this time, the flooding and rescuers still searching for those missing after those devastating floods in Tennessee, just how unprecedented was that rainfall there? And what's the wider impact now, you think? So preliminary numbers are 17.26 inches of rain. Some of the radar estimates were upwards of 21 inches. And we are not talking about a tropical system. Those are the types of numbers you anticipate from a tropical cyclone or tropical storm, hurricane, right? So not only does that smash the state record for Tennessee, uh, it is one of the top in the nation for non-tropical events. Uh, two to three inches per hour fell. And it all happened because of just a really unfortunate setup. You had this really strong low-level jet. That's where all the moisture kind of gets fueled up. When we're storm chasing, we can see those clouds like rocketing across the sky. That was bringing the moisture. It hit the stationary front, which is just what it sounds, stationary. It doesn't move much. And it kept producing thunderstorms. What happened was a training thunderstorm event. So these thunderstorms popped dropped a ton of rain, two to three inches per hour, and then did this feedback loop where they kept building back over the same areas that got hit again. The computer modeling, this is interesting, nailed it spatially. So the National Weather Service knew they were going to have a flash flood event. They could have never known the quantity of water that was going to fall. And that's it. You know, the, the computer models were saying four or five inches, not 17. And that's what I think we get out of this going forward is how do we start thinking about the future of how we even forecast as scientists that do this? Do we start taking, and we have to start taking climate change uh, and the a warmer atmosphere, it's basic physics, can hold more water. So that mm. could be a part of this. Let me just say though, there is always another part. And unfortunately, because they do not have big elevation around them. I was trying to figure out, even if you get two to three inch, four inch per hour rainfall rates, how does a wall of water five to six feet high show up in 60 seconds? There may be something else at play here. Maybe there's a storm drain issue somewhere. Maybe there's some sort of debris that was holding back water and then burst. Either way, 17.26 inches smashes a state record by five inches. And that's the type of extreme we talk about being a symptom of climate change. Not that we've attributed it directly to this event yet, but it makes sense that it would. I mean, it's, it's wild. It's wild to think of that. And, and uh, we got you here. We're going to take you on a tour of some of these recent stories and get your sense from your studies of climate change on, on the potential contribution that it might have made. We all remember those pictures uh, you were reporting on and out of Western Europe, including Germany, when they received up to two months worth of rainfall in two days. Another event like that. Uh, Van Alstreeters say that the rainfall was made up to nine times more likely by the climate cr crisis. Now that's a, a modeling of it. So what does the situation there mean for the future when it comes to rainfall and deadly floods? And, and are you confident in that science that can say, oh, climate change made this nine times more likely? I think that the basic physics are there again. Warmer temperature holds more water. That's a basic part of physics. However, uh, when we talk about what happened there, it was a blocking pattern. The specific blocking pattern we call a Rex block. They have a lot of different words for it in, in their meteorology in Europe. But either way, a Rex block where the low pressure system sat right under the high and they kind of get stuck there like gears and they keep working against each other. So that's not new. We've seen Rex blocks before, but we have never in our recorded history and in Europe, they've got a longer breadth of data to go back on. So yes, I can... I can buy into the science and, and do every day that a warmer planet means that we could have more extreme events. That said, we cannot 
not talk about how we build and how we engineer our water and the interface between where humans live and where water is supposed to flow. We are not doing that perfectly, not just in Europe, certainly here in the United States. When we build going forward, that should be our number one priority. If I were the Biden administration, I think that's what I would make my first priority is how do we make permeable surfaces? You know how in news you always hear this cliche of, oh, the road became a river. The road became a river because we gave it a riverbed of asphalt. That would not have been a river if it were wild grasses. So there is a combination of how we treat the planet on its surface, which we have changed significantly, and greenhouse gas emissions. Meanwhile, there's been hundreds of deaths in the Pacific Northwest this summer due to all-time record heat. So how do the heat and wildfires in the U.S. this summer compare to previous years, Ginger? If you look at just the last couple of years in California, for example, this year and last year to date, we're about 1.5 million acres burned. You say, okay, well, that doesn't really tell me anything. Compared to the five-year average, that is almost a million acres more. So last year and this year are epic. I mean, record-breaking. When we did it last year, you, get, you sit there and you think, well, we can't possibly do it again next year. Oh, we have, and we're on our way to what will be inevitably a horrible future for not just California, but Pacific Northwest when it comes to this wildfire season. You know that Cal Fire has now said there is no wildfire season. It's all year. And you're seeing the numbers on your screen there. Um, they are really stunning. And of course, how do we get there? Drought, prolonged drought. When you bake the soil, when you bake the foliage, you are going to end up creating this tinder situation. Land management has a ton to do with it. People are always going to bring that up. But so does all-time heat. And that's what we saw this year. Hundreds of people dead from Canada through the Pacific Northwest because not only all-time record heat of 116, but for three days in a row, Portland broke their all-time record. Lytton, British Columbia, 121 degrees. Y'all, just to remind you, Las Vegas has never made it above 117. So when you have that strong of a ridge that we have never seen in our recorded history, and you bake the area for three days, you give them no relief at night, which they usually would see, especially in the Cascades, you are going to have deaths and you're going to have the setup, the perfect setup for a horrible fire season. Hmm. And and lastly, Ginger, we just saw it there on the screen. You mentioned the two largest reservoirs in the country, both reaching their lowest levels on record. And in all this, now we've taken this tour of the world with you. You hear uh, people say, uh, you know, climate's always changing. I was talking to a dairy farmer in uh, in yeah. Wisconsin not long ago, and he said, yeah, it's it's bad, Dre, but I, I you know we got a lot of rain. He's getting washed out in places, and his uh, his manure. Uh, you know, pile is, is, is getting uh, watched by local environmental authorities. But he says, I've been a dairy farmer for 40 years. Climate's always been, you know, something every farmer has to deal with. How do you answer that in, in a way that can, that can communicate to people that it's different? This is different. He's right. Climate is always changing. The Arctic did have palm trees. That's the, how our planet works. We go in cycles. What makes this different and how we know this is different is because of paleoclimatology. We can look back thousands of years. I am in conversation right now with some uh, university workers in Montana that take cores out of lakes all the way down into ice cores but, or just lake beds. And they can tell for hundreds and thousands of years based on ash, how bad wildfire seasons were, how bad the heat was. They can do these things way back then. And you say, okay, but we always had these cycles. We did, but never did we see this rate of change this quickly before in any of that paleoclimatology. And that's the answer. The rapid rate of change, there is only one thing that that can be attributed to. It's us. People will say, yeah, but what about the sun? What about volcanoes? There are a lot of other things that impact this, and they're right too just not nearly as much. When you look at the graphic that compares all those things, there are two lines going up and it's greenhouse gas emissions from humans and then it's the temperature and those two are hanging out together. I will mention one other thing because a lot of people need this information and I think it's really hard to hear. Uh, when you look at someone like Lake Mead, Arizona this year, first time federal government's gonna have a water shortage. Arizona's gonna get 18% less water from the Colorado River Basin. We're going to see 7% less for Nevada, 5% less for Mexico. 
a place that I just was doing that story where I was sitting next to this 19th century church that had been covered with water because they created a dam and then was unearthed basically uh, or unwatered uh, when this mega drought has set up in that part of Mexico. We have to think about not only the droughts and the, the impact of our greenhouse gas emissions, but it's our water usage. This is the easy one. This is the one that nobody can fight, nobody can deny, and has a lot to do with why Lake Mead, Lake Powell, all of these are also at lowest. We're using the water and not just agriculture, not just residential, all over. You think about how much evaporates out of each of those reservoirs. You think about the use of them to make the foods that we want. It's going to come down to the engineering because I do believe, and this is why I have a whole segment every Thursday night right here on ABC News Live called It's Not Too Late. I don't think it's too late. I think we have choices. You see me there uh, on It's Not Too Late in Lake Powell. That arch used to be covered by water just a couple of years ago. Break in Lake Powell. I go to these places and most of the time, I think that the innovation and technology that humans are capable of and the human spirit, I don't lose hope. Uh, most of the time, I feel very hopeful and I feel like we just got to move. It's time. Oh. ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, thank you for that insight and for that optimism. We need it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.